Hi, I'm Randy Pike. Always best known in these circles as Nina Petro's husband. I don't think anybody knows me as knows me as anything else. I will talk to you a very little bit about my experience as a caregiver, though the stories, the stories, I could talk for hours on the stories. I've not told myself I can't cry not cry, like not show you my pain. You know, you get to see that, to hide my pain from my ca fellow caregivers. You would absolutely know that I'm full of bull pucky. There's too much pain to hide it away now. Some of this sounds like I know what I'm talking about. Conversely, most of this sounds like I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm only able to speak from the position of being a caregiver to a cholangeal carcinoma patient, as close as I was to the illness, as good as I had gotten at keeping my finger on the pulse on this disease. I have no idea what it's like to hear the words, you have cancer. I do know, however, what it's like to care for a cholangeal carcinoma patient and be married to a wife that's terminally ill while being a business owner and the father to three sons, one of which was a newborn baby in a place with no familial support. I know what it's like to drain ascites from the belly of my wife. I know what it's like to watch a wife cry as the news of the disease has progressed. The trial isn't working. It's hard and it's deep. I know what it's like to watch a wife pass softly to the other side after a valiant effort to cling to life. I know the peace I found on her face. No more disease. No more cancer. I know the feeling of her close grip on my life now and how she feels. And how she feels each of the heartbeats of our son. These things. I know what this is like to be a badass caregiver. I know what that's like. But I don't know what it's like to be a patient, so some of this will make sense. And some of this will not. I'll never forget the day as I sat there next to Nina holding our five-week-old Nicholas. The words hit like a ton of bricks. You have a mass in your liver. As well as I believe I can express how I feel, I'll never be able to explain to you how that felt. It was overwhelming, overwhelmingly troubling, soulfully so. Immediately upon receipt of the news, I started searching for a guide. I needed to know how I would feel so I could prepare myself, my wife, and my family. I was their leader, and I needed to be brought up to speed on how I could best navigate throughout the journey. But there's nothing. There's no step-by-step -step instructional manual, no operating procedure of do this, then that. And I'm a military veteran. We need lots of manuals. <laughs> we need, excuse me, we need lots and lots of manuals. But cancer still happened, and so did I. As much as I thought as as much as I thought I needed a guide, I really didn't need anything. Every cancer experience is unique. Every individual is unique. So how could anyone possibly tell you what to expect? They can't, and I can't either. But what I can do is leave you with a few thoughts. As a caregiver, you will think some of the darkest thoughts imaginable. You need to know you're not alone. Some of this will be hard for you to hear, and it's really hard for me to say, but listen with an open heart if you're a caregiver. Know I walk this road ahead of you, and I need you to pick up what I'm putting down for my truest, most genuine heart of hearts. Your experience will be different from mine. I promise you it will. Some of your cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma patients will find true remission, 
quite possibly a cure. Some of you will not. But I'm hopeful my experience will resonate with you. I need it to. You need it to. We will both be better off when it does. As open as I have always felt when discussing my experience as a caregiver, there were certainly things I never discussed out of fear of hurting Nina. Though these things are very real, I did not believe they could be communicated with her as I genuinely felt them. Everything in its time and in its place. In this phase of my relationship with Nina, it is critical for me to preserve her legacy and honor her life, so I'm hopeful. What I have to offer is received as, construct as constructive for my caregiving peers. And trust me, the last thing you'll hear from me is I'm so sorry. Number one is physical intimacy. The 400 pound gorilla in the room that everyone sees but no one talks about. I created a blog to journal my experience. I built quite a relationship with many fellow caregivers. With all of us, zero physical intimacy was a common theme. Cancer and sex don't go together. They just don't and they just won't. Take this time to allow your idea of intimacy to evolve and find new ways to make connections with your partner. Talk, talk a lot. Lay out your fears, cry, build a platform onto which you place your true self and let your patients see you in your most vulnerable space. Create new levels of connection with your partner. You'll be moved. Two, your patient is still a human being. I sat in a spirit circle in May of 2018. The, the discussion was all about caring for an ill spouse. We all discussed our fears. I tried to explain when I got frustrated with Nina, I felt a huge amount of guilt. When I explained this to the group, the leader of that circle immediately interjected with words, I'll never forget she's still a human being. So simple, but so true. Coworkers, children, spouses, cancer patients. We get frustrated with all of them. You will not spend thousands of hours in a hospital and not experience frustra frustration with your patients. Get used to it, it's going to happen. Don't give yourself license to just always be frustrated, but, give, but forgive yourself for popping off at the mouth. Then apologize and get over it. Remember, they're still a human being. And by the way, the frustration and the guilt do not go away regardless where you are. Number three is take charge. Nina was fiercely independent, but I implemented a very strict travel policy on her. After her doctors increased the dosage on her pain medications, I found her covered in blood on the bathroom floor after falling and hitting her head. After this, I did not allow her out of bed unless I was there to carry her. You know the carry. You know the carry, her hands in mine, me walking backwards and her forever forwards. I miss carrying her like that. This went on for months and I didn't care what she thought and I didn't care what anyone else thought. I was only going to find her with blood pouring out of her head one time. We had a two-year-old son at the time, so as you might imagine, life around my house was total chaos. If she had to pee and I wasn't answering her immediately, she was required to go in the bed and I, if she couldn't hold it. Choosing between the evils of her dying of a head injury or me cleaning up urine was an easy decision for me to make. When the disease progressed, I also canceled visits from, fin from friends and family. I wanted to cater to everyone due to the high strung emotions, but it became entirely too stressful. Focus only on your family units, and when the people get touchy, it's okay. Number four is advice. In the worst of times, people will tell you how to live your life. They have zero info and not a stitch of experience, but there they are, wanting to tell you exactly what you need to be doing. There are two things to which I have always held true. If someone is telling you what you need, they don't know what you need. And what's the worst that can happen if you don't follow their advice? Nothing happens. That's your patient. Take charge. Follow these two things and you'll be just fine. 
Number five is wondering how you'll make it. Such a critical part of the spiritual evolution of a caregiver is the human side of the disease. I'll never forget having one of my closest caregiver friends on the phone when we both revealed we constantly worried about affording stuff after our spouses passed. It's natural. You'll wonder, if you don't enjoy independent wealth, how do you not? You'll worry about it. You'll make a big deal about it. Then you'll feel horrible for ever thinking about it. And then you'll think about it some more. It's okay, accept it. We all do it. Number six is get intuitive. I don't know how to, how to tell you how to do this, but this saved my life. I was already intuitively sensitive, but when I heard someone tell me, you're not getting it, and if you don't get it now, you'll never get it, I got really tuned in. I started paying attention to the spirit and how it was move, moving me every day without me ever noticing my own evolution. Then I started meditating and praying, and bam. My heart started getting overwhelmingly full of love, and I could see so many wonderful things happening even amongst all the horror of, horror of this beautiful, brutal disease. So whatever it takes, get your soul tuned in and do not be afraid. Number seven is find an outlet. Mine was writing a blog, putting together puzzles and playing the guitar. I, get lost. I got lost in all of these activities every night. In these places, I found a therapeutic, peaceful escape. Throughout the journey, I could tell when I missed a night of writing or playing. I got edgy and lost in the horror once again. Whatever it is you do, do this thing daily. Just ensure it's positive, productive, and rewarding. Number eight, brilliant, brilliantly fill the pages of your life. You're the author of your life, you're the creator, write big, beautiful stories, regardless of the hand you were dealt without paying any attention to where you are in your fight. Live and live mightily. Admittedly, there were so many months I could not follow the simple piece of advice. Sometimes it's like I've forgotten how it was, cancer. Appointments, bad news, bad news, and more bad news. I'm having so much trouble with this point and telling it to you but it's critical, be courageously bold. Nine, and the last one, is the University Hospital in San Antonio. From the bottom of my heart, I think Dr. Hoff and Lori Satoff, Dr. Fritchie, the Texas Liver Tumor Center and the University Transplant Systems in Texas. We felt as if we were a part of the team and I'll never be able to thank them enough. I feel as if I am forever indebted to them, how they treated me as a human, my wife not as a patient, but as a friend. Thank you all for having me. There've been plenty of days I just never knew how I would make it. But cancer doesn't define who I am. Cancer certainly does not define who Nina was or is now to my family. I only feel as if I need to build a big, beautiful life in spite of it all. 